Welcome to the fifth webinar installment in the Hydrocephalus Canada and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation and the Hydrocephalus and sorry, the Association de Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus du Quebec Youth Webinar Series sponsored by the Sick Kids Foundation. I'm Shauna Bodway. I'm the Director of Programs and Information at Hydrocephalus Canada. I will share moderator duties for tonight's webinar with Hydrocephalus Canada's Community Support Coordinator, Andrea Walters. Tonight's webinar will recap the previous four webinar discussions, highlighting the key points of the sessions on social skills and friendships, life skills and independence, transitioning to adulthood, community interaction and recreation for youth with hydrocephalus and spina bifida. Our presenters are Steph DiMartino, Melissa Thorne, Kristen and Kristen English. So if you've got questions, we've got answers tonight. So in the first session, um, if you joined us in the first session, you would have seen Melissa and I uh, having a chat and talking about um, some of the key issues that we found growing up with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. So some of the high school key messages that we wanted to um, take away or that we had take away was, you know, true friends stick with you no matter your quirks or differences. Um, being independent and trying new things op will open up a world of possibilities for you. Um, for instance, you know, you might be really interested in a hobby, but you're not sure if it's the right thing for you. So, you know, you want to give it a try. And if it is, that's great. And maybe you want to join a club to that, um, you know, specializes in something like say darts, for instance. Um, and that will also open you up to meeting new friends. And we also think that being engaged with the world around you and advocating for your needs is a strong point for you to practice with family and friends, and it will help you to become more independent as well. Um, the community interaction and recreation key messages that we discussed in our webinar talked about getting involved with as many activities in your school and community as you can. Um, both Melissa and I come from a small town, so um, it was a little more um, challenging, I guess you could say, to find the activities that were more inclusive for us. Um, but we we figured out ways to do that. Um, both of us were scorekeepers for uh, local softball teams. Um, school, you know, for me, um, you know, activities, sporting activities was not my thing. So I got more into um, dramatic arts and, and different um, social groups like the Spirit Club. Um, so you know, getting involved can help you make friends, um, keep you active and help with your mental health. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Melissa. All right, so the key messages that we talked about um, with the transition to adulthood will be learning to manage money and create budget, a budget. Um, Learning these skills early really helped me to be able to go off to college by myself and understand the uh, meaning of money and how uh, to buy things, how to save my money and all those types of things. Uh, the next one would be um, to navigate the tran transit system. Um, I come from a small town, like Shauna said, and there is no transit system there. Um, so moving to Toronto was uh, a big eye opener and to London where I went to school. Um, so working on those skills, being able to read a map, um, being able to um, figure out the route to where you're going is really important and being able to, to know where you are on the route, just in case something happens, maybe the bus breaks down or you have an emergency and you have to get off to know where you are need to go and where you are, um, which is really important. Um, we also talked about uh, learning to do chores around the house so you can be prepared for when you have your own house or when you go off to college or when you're living with roommates. So be able to do laundry or 
being able to uh, do the dishes or cook meals, all those types of things are really important and are something that I um, have really worked on myself, learning how to do them just and maybe in a different way. So that's really important. And, and um, being able to, to work on those skills with family and friends is really a really good way to be able to practice. Um, the next one would be know how to make more, take more control of your medical appointments and your care, such as asking questions in your appointments, making your own appointments, directing your care if you have a personal support worker, ordering your supplies. Um, uh, we talked about knowing how to explain your diagnosis to people um, and know your medications um, and know what dosages you have you have to take. Um, knowing all those things makes you uh, makes it easier when you go into the adult care system um, in the appointments because the doctors will ask you all of those questions um, as well. So being able to start practicing those early is really a way to be able to, to be confident in, 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 those, in those areas and be confident when you do have to start doing those on your own. Um, and the next one was uh, know what you need to do and need help with. Um, so if you're moving out and you're going to school, um, knowing what equipment, equipment you might need, what accommodations you might need for your classes, if you might need to, to set up PSW support, all those kind of things that you can sit down with your mom or a family member and chat out what you need to set up and what support you need to be uh, independent and successful in your journey after school. Uh, really key in that in that respect. Next slide. Next slide, please. I think it's off to Stephanie and Melissa now to go over their uh, overview of the second webinar. Yes. So um, we talked about social skills and friendship skills. So next slide. Okay, so some of the topics that we focused on during the second webinar was tips and tricks of conversation. Um, so some things that you can do at home or at school or things just to keep in mind that can help you interact with people and build um, better relationships and hopefully connections uh, to build those friendships so that you can hang out with people maybe outside of school or outside of a normal environment that you see them in, something a little bit more personal. Uh, staying connected with peers. We discussed a lot about apps, social media, um, different ways to interact with people because if you can't see them in person, there's other ways to do that. Um, when you do see them in person, maybe some things that you can do with them. Making plans with peers. So knowing how to initiate maybe making plans with someone, uh, things to consider, coming up with a plan, um, how to know when you when it's a good time to actually approach someone and ask them if they want to hang out um, or do something or plan something. Uh, maybe if someone comes up to you, how to navigate that, whether you're comfortable with it or maybe you're not, and how to address those kind of um, situations. Sharing your disability with others. Um, so knowing how much to share, who to share it with, um, if they have questions, knowing how to answer them so that they understand, um, those kinds of things. Boundaries is a big one. So knowing what you can tolerate with friends. So we discussed a lot with sometimes people can text and keep trying to get in contact with you, which can be overwhelming sometimes, or maybe it's the other way around where you keep reaching out to someone and you're not getting anything back, um, how to address that kind of situation. Um, listening also to your body. And if you're tired, not always saying yes, it's okay to say no sometimes. Um, and being able to have some time for yourself. So in terms of boundaries, knowing when you've done too much and you need a break, uh, knowing kind of what your limit is, understanding your body and what it needs. We talked a little bit about sleepovers. So when's a good time to have a sleepover, things to consider when having a sleepover, um, understanding that when you plan something, it's okay if it doesn't go to plan. 
and Melissa and I kind of discussed um, our first times having sleepovers and how we envisioned it to be a great experience and it was going to be amazing and it doesn't always turn out that way but you keep trying and getting outside your comfort zone um, and eventually you'll have a good experience and and be able to connect with peers um, somewhere other than your home maybe it's their home maybe it's some um, camp maybe it's a program anything like that so knowing what you need um, to plan for it because sleepovers sometimes do take a lot of planning um, and kind of thinking of all situations in your head which can can go different directions and being able to plan for those things getting outside your comfort zone. So that's kind of in every social situation, right? It could be anything from joining a new program. It could be starting a new volunteer opportunity. It could be going into a new school, right? So all those things are things that can kind of bring about some nervous emotions, um, but knowing that everyone kind of experiences those and that it's okay to feel those things and Hopefully you'll be able to meet other people that are in similar situations um, and being able to maybe approach them with some of those tips and tricks from conversation, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we talked a lot about resources and apps because, you know, we're all techie nowadays and there's so many great um, apps and resources out there. So March of Dimes Canada is a great resource, um, Hydrocephalus Canada, any kind of hospital. Um, in wherever you're located is also a good resource. Community centers are huge, clubs, um, any kind of organization that you might be interested in. Um, and then of course, Melissa touched on all of these areas um, and her experience um, throughout her life so far. Melissa, anything you wanna add? No, I think you did awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, yeah, we discussed a little bit about some tips and tricks of conversation. So these are things that I think people need to remember throughout their life, because sometimes we can forget the simple things. And these simple things are what can kind of take us to the next level and get to know someone on a deeper level and connect more meaningfully, right? Um, so some tips we kind of talked about was in order to have a conversation with someone, someone has to ask someone a question. So someone has to have enough courage to approach someone and say, hey, what's up? Or give a head nod and say, how is your day going? Right? So someone has to do that. We talked about sharing information about yourself. So not just giving a one word answer. If someone was courageous enough to approach you and start a conversation, try not to just give them a one word answer. Give them a little bit, little bit more detail. Um, continuing a conversation. So when someone asks you a question, um, ask the same question back at them, get them involved, right? Because a conversation needs to be two ways in order for people to really get something out of it and feel like they're both being heard, right? Um, asking follow-up questions. So we went back to the who, what, where, when, why, um, and talking about those to think of different questions on topics. Show your interest. That's a big one. I know with uh, COVID and being on on Zoom a lot, uh, it's hard in person. And sometimes we forget eye contact, facing someone, head nods, smiles, um, just the way your bot, like what your nonverbals are saying, as well as what your verbals are saying, right? So saying like, cool, nice. I didn't know that. Those are all um, some strategies you can use. And then we discuss some social media and tech to kind of keep up um, connections with peers. So if you can't see them, you can FaceTime them. You could play Discord with them. You can do an app such as Bunch where you can play a whole bunch of different games together. Um, there's so many options, both when it comes to social media and tech. Um, if you're not able to see someone in person, you can still be connected and have that friendship grow. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what we talked about in our social and friendship skills webinar. That's a great uh, tips and trick list. So um, these slides are available as well. Uh, if you want to receive them, just let us know by email. Are there any questions right now? Okay, I don't see any hands raised or any questions in the Q&A. So I guess we will continue. Next slide, please.
All right, so I'll jump in here. Um, so I was able to facilitate our third webinar with Melissa, and that was community interaction and recreation. Um, and this was really just about um, having some conversations around tapping into what recreation and leisure looks like for different individuals, because it is so different from person to person, and how to then, once you've identified those interests, um, how to explore those in the community, find the supports you need. Um, and we talked a little bit about uh, adapted equipment and that role in adapted sport and recreation as well. So we can go right into the next slide. Um, so right off the top, that first part about, you know, finding meaning in the, the leisure activities that we have in, in our days. Um, and that really starts with identifying what matters most to you. Um, there's so many reasons why people choose to participate in the activities they do and different reasons why people enjoy something and what they get out of it. So um, thinking about the activities and experiences that you've had in the past and the ones that were positive, um, we don't always take the time to stop and reflect on what it was about those activities that we really enjoyed. Was it the people? Um, was it the places? Do you enjoy, you know, the serenity of being outdoors in nature? Or um, are you somebody who prefers a quiet activity at home? Um, and the feelings associated with those different um, recreation experiences? Do you like the thrill of, an, of a new activity um, or the social connectedness and sense of belonging you got when you were a part of a team or a club? Um, and there's also a lot of accomplishments that we can get out of our recreation and leisure um, activities by you know, building confidence and self-esteem, exploring what our own abilities are. And sometimes these different activities lead us to build new skills that can transfer not just to a recreation setting, but beyond into life skills, career skills, uh, things like teamwork and cooperation. Um, so that was sort of the, the beginning of our session. And then um, we kind of went into the next step, which is really then exploring based on those interests. So where to go, oops, sorry, we're gonna go back one slide. Thanks. <laughs> um, where to go um, to try new things. Um, so we started at a small level in, the, in your own neighborhood, community, um, just, uh, you know, even somewhere like your local library sometimes has programs that you may not realize. Um, and then on a, at a bigger level, you can often find um, information about new opportunities, for example, sports, um, through bigger organizations that are hubs of information for where to participate in that, you know, what is your local chapter. Um, some examples there in Ontario, we have Parasport Ontario, and they over see a really broad range of uh, adapted sports and they can help connect you directly to who the best um, you know, league or person to, to talk with if you would like to get involved in that in your area. Um, and being open-minded. So I think Steph and Melissa has already touched on this a little bit, but um, that's an important part of the process too. Sometimes you surprise yourself when you are willing to maybe put yourself out there a little bit and try something new. Um, I know Melissa shared um, some really positive experiences that she had growing up. Um, and I, I can't even remember how long the list was of different activities that she was involved in. Um, and for her, I remember, you know, her mom was a key person to help her kind of navigate and advocate. Um, and, you know, again, reaching out to sort of what your local resources are if you need some help um, with that navigation process. So, um, <clears throat> In Ontario, we have Holland Gorview um, as one of those knowledge hubs. Um, but then more broadly, too, uh, Hydrocephalus Canada has plenty of resources on their website to kind of help guide what you're looking for. Planning, of course, so making the time to participate and, and acknowledging why it is important to participate in recreation and leisure and the benefits for us physically, mentally, socially, um, there's so much that we can get out of these sort of free time activities that 
Um, it's important for us to prioritize and make time for them um, and asking questions. So if you're contemplating or considering um, attending a new program or an event, um, ask your questions ahead of time um, and be prepared. So you can reach out via email or phone and, um, you know, ask sort of your who, what, when, where's um, to get the information that might make you feel more comfortable about um, trying that activity for the first time. You may want to ask who the program facilitators are, um, their experiences. Uh, you may want to ask about the size if you're somebody who maybe is um, intimidated in larger crowds, then maybe you want to find a smaller program to start, work your way up. Um, and, you know, lots of questions about the location itself, accessibility, uh, what's the physical space like, have you had other individuals uh, with disabilities attend this program before? Um, and then knowing your, uh, your own needs and your own abilities and strengths and being able to advocate and communicate those um, when you are uh, exploring a new program or activity. And the last one, of course, is enjoying. So um, living in the moment and experiencing those, uh, those activities and also then going back to reflecting on when you had that positive experience, what was it that, that made that really key for you? And that can help carry forward for the next time when you're, you're looking to get involved. So now I'll advance to, to the next slide. So we, done, we then uh, spent the, the latter half of that webinar talking about adapted recreation equipment and where to find it. Um, so we gave some specific examples, but also discussed kind of the three different ways that you can usually access these. So it might be that um, adapted recreation equipment is included in the activity. We gave the example of adapted sailing. Obviously, that's a really large, expensive piece of equipment that nobody's going to want to run out and buy on a win. It's something they're exploring for the first time. So that's often something through um, somewhere like CanSail and their programs. They would provide that to you while you're having your first experience. Um, sometimes locations themselves in the community um, will have uh, adapted equipment um, and the example we gave is bowling ramps so sometimes calling ahead and asking if they have um, things like that available uh, kind of save you some time and planning and um, community recreation centers often have um, different equipment available as well. Uh, and then there are organizations that actually might be able to help with a loan or helping source equipment that you're interested in. Um, at Holland Boardview, we provide a, an equipment loan service to um, kids and families, but we also have Parasport Ontario who does uh, sport equipment rentals, um, CADS, Canadian Adaptive Snow Sports. They run out of various um, ski hills across Canada and they have adapted equipment and snowboard equipment right on site, as well as um, instructors. So um, again, these are just good hums, hubs of information um, to tap into when you're exploring these and just good to know what options are out there. Um, did I miss anything, Melissa? I don't think, I don't think so. I know Melissa also shared again that experience of coming from a small town and what that was like um, trying to find recreation and how she overcame that. So that was a definite highlight as well. I have a Chris, uh, question, Kristen. Um, if there isn't any adaptive activities in the community that you live in, how do you go about asking the city to start including mm -hmm. um, some adaptive activities? Yeah, so I think that's where it's something that you don't need to do alone. So I think reaching out to um, sort of your, your support network. So um, whether it's Hydro Seven Plus Canada or, you know, in my case, I, I often get um, phone calls at Holland Floorview of people exploring very similar things. Um, and having somebody kind of help guide and navigate how maybe another um, region uh, or more rural uh, location was able to source equipment. I know um, Ontario Para Network, for instance, um, part of their mandate is to, to bring accessibility to the individuals that want to get involved in sport. And so they actually have partnered with local YMCAs um, and other community centers who maybe were looking to have uh, a fleet of sport wheelchairs. 
at their location so that say they could start a wheelchair basketball league. Um, so it's, I would say like one, you don't need to do that alone. Um, I think starting with doing that outreach, maybe this is something that other, others have inquired about before um, and uh, understanding what the barrier or perceived barrier is from the end of, you know, the other receiving end of, of that request. Um, and then reaching out for, for sort of help with, with navigating next steps. So if it's equipment, then um, reaching out to some of the examples we gave um, can be a really nice way. They're often looking to partner and, and um, you know, we'll look into assisting with grant writing or whatever is required, depending on what that barrier is. Um, and then if it's a smaller scale thing, if it's if it's not much that's required um, and doesn't need a big scale project, then really just um, knowing yourself and what your abilities, needs, and interests are, and then reaching out to communicate those. Sometimes um, lack of awareness, unfortunately, is one of the barriers. And so just understanding that maybe it's a very small change or piece of equipment that would actually open up doors to not only you, but probably a lot of other people in the future. So just knowing what you need and being able to articulate that can sometimes start um, some really meaningful conversations because there's a lot of folks that um, aspire to be more accessible, um, but maybe lack the experience and knowledge. So um, you, know, you can share your experience and, and request, but also don't forget that you've got lots of resources that can also um, help with that part. Great, thanks. That was great. Okay, and on to our fourth webinar, which was run by Stephanie and Melissa participated as well. Yeah, so this one had to do with independence and life skills. And we talked about a lot of things. <laughs> so our first one was about knowing your diagnosis. So being able to explain it to people in a simplified way. So you don't have to get into crazy details and let them know every inch of what you're going through or what you have or what you feel and things like that. Just something very brief that they can understand um, uh, what your diagnosis is. So kind of simplifying it, maybe providing some like signs and symptoms to look out for. Um, we talked about getting involved in your healthcare. So can be anything from uh, scheduling appointments for yourself, talking in appointments, or being able to share something while you're in an appointment. Um, booking, so knowing what your schedule is and where to book it, knowing the phone numbers of um, some of your healthcare providers, knowing their names, knowing the addresses is how you're going to get there. Um, we talked about medication and allergies, which is also involved with kind of getting involved in your healthcare. So medications, me and Melissa kind of talked about, you don't have to memorize all your medications. A lot of them, some of them are quite difficult. And if you have, say, six pills that you're taking or something like that, it can be really hard to remember the exact names. Um, but maybe you know the colors of them, how many there are, what size they are. Maybe you know the dosage. Um, just kind of not knowing, you don't necessarily have to know everything if you're getting support from a family member or um, someone else, but at least starting the process of kind of getting involved when it comes to medications and knowing what they are. And Melissa gave a great example of what she uses to keep track of her, her medications. And Melissa, I don't know if you want to share again. Sure. Um, so I have all my diagnoses, all of my medications and allergies and things in my phone in the health app because um, I can't remember all of it. <laughs> um, so I have it in there just in case I need it. And it's all my dosages, um, the times I need to take them and all that kind of stuff. And it's really helpful to be able to stay organized and in appointments when my doctor asks for my meds, it's just easy just to hand them the phone and be like, here it is. <laughs> so it's, it's one way to become a little bit more independent and work on those skills. Absolutely. Yeah. And Melissa uses the health app, but you can use your notes. You can use any other app that you're comfortable with. Just kind of it's trial and error to see what works for you. Some people like to carry like a, a paper book. Um, and when they go to appointments, they have everything kind of like, if it's like a red book, for example, that they bring everywhere. Um, 
also with your medications and allergies, knowing where they're stored. And Melissa brought up a great point about knowing what time to take them. So another skill building um, thing to do is to, if you haven't been in charge of when you're taking your meds or remembering, um, maybe it's finding alarms or any kind of strategy, whether it's a smartwatch that kind of gives you the reminders, or maybe it's a routine that you do. Like after you brush your teeth, you always take your meds. So um, finding what works for you. And it's a lot of trial and error. Um, when it comes to allergies, knowing what your allergies are, what your reactions are. If you've had a reaction, what's the best measure to kind of bring you back to um, like baseline, things like that scheduling, time management. Those are huge ones. I think for everyone, this is usually a struggle. Um, it's really hard to manage whether you're in school, whether you got work, whether personal life, family life, like there's so many things to consider, right? So finding what works for you. And Melissa and I kind of discussed what works um, for us or all the clients that I've worked with, what has been kind of a common theme, whether it is an app and using tech or it's pen and paper, um, being able to like prioritize what you might have um, and not to overwhelm yourself when it comes to scheduling and time management because you do have a lot going on. So kind of breaking it down. Um, some people like to use calendars in the kitchen or they have their individual ones. So just during our webinar, we talked about different options that are available and kind of, um, gave you guys some tips and tricks of what we do and what we know some of our clients to do as well. Um, then we kind of went into cooking, money skills, transit skills, chores around the home and social life. So we really got into it when we talked about cooking. It's not about necessarily cooking a giant meal for a family. Uh, it might just be starting off small, whether it's putting something in the microwave and heating it up then moving up to a toaster oven, then moving up to the stove, the stove or oven um, and heating something up that way, then getting into your knife skills, then getting into more complex meals, right? So um, working your way up, there's no, um, no need to kind of jump um, to go to something a little bit more intense. Um, and it could be even at home starting to watch like a family member cook. So you can kind of get um, an understanding of of safety in the home. And we talked a little bit about making it maybe more adaptable, right? So if your oven and stove aren't adapt aren't accessible for you, um, you can use induction plates or griddles and put them at a lower, um, maybe at a different table or something that gives you more space, right? So kind of um, testing those out. Same with like uh, cutting boards, having um, the different types of cutting boards that have suction cups on them for less sliding, just if you're nervous about safety or having a knife that's attached to a cutting board. So it's like a pivot knife. So it's just one less thing that you have to think about um, if you're starting to cook and you're just um, wanting something that might be a little bit more helpful. Um, money skills. So we went into like making a purchase, especially with COVID. A lot of people haven't been going into stores or maybe no longer use cash. They use card. Um, and we kind of talked about that and, and budgeting. So if you're getting any kind of funding from the government or your work or anything like that, you get an allowance, um, knowing how to budget your money and starting off small. So maybe just kind of monitoring what you do, how much you spend per week, per month and go from there. Um, and we talked about bills. So the inevitable bills, the inevitable bills that we all have and knowing maybe how much things cost. Because if we have someone doing it for us, we might not know how much our phone bill is. So being able to know how much your phone bill is or what bills to even consider if you ever want to move out, um, whether it's like your utilities, your Netflix bill, all of those things, right? They all add up. Um, and then we talked a little bit about transit. So it could be your local transit, so subway, streetcar, go train, any of those kinds of things, but also maybe use Uber, maybe use Lyft, maybe use taxis, knowing how to navigate those platforms. Um, so whether it's a phone call or an app, um, connecting your credit card to it um, in order for payment, um, 
talking about reading a map. Melissa talked a lot about going from a small town to the big city and having to navigate maps and look at signs and stranger safety because there's a lot more people to consider. Um, and we went through that. Um, and then chores around the home. So in terms of like gaining independence and life skills, um, everyone goes at their different pace, right? But laundry is something we all got to do. Cleaning up after ourselves, whether it's your room or dishes, or maybe it's even grocery shopping. So we're not saying that you have to do all these things all at once, but at least be exposed to it. So when it comes to laundry, um, maybe it's you're just doing the folding right now and eventually you'll get into the sorting um, and then you'll do the washing, the drying, knowing how much detergent, fabric softener, knowing what all those things do. Um, when it comes to cleaning, are you vacuuming in the house? Are you kind of pulling your weight? Um, could be just making your bed could be folding your clothes and putting them into their drawers, um, dishes. Maybe it's just stacking the dishwasher. Maybe it's actually washing the dishes. Maybe it's just pressing the button, but you're at least kind of getting exposed to it. So um, you're building those skills, right? And then grocery shopping as well is a big one. So do you know how much things cost nowadays? Do you know how much food you consume in a week? How often do you go grocery shopping? Do you know how to navigate in the grocery store? Um, do you know um, more about like um, how much to budget for when it comes to grocery shopping um, and what you enjoy eating and all of that stuff? Um, and then lastly, we kind of talked about social life because social is a huge part of your independence and life skills, right? Like everyone wants to feel connected to people and, and planning outings and how do you know when someone's your friend and... Um, when to disclose your disability to your friends, right? So um, quite a bit we talked about in this one. It was pretty jam-packed. Um, I don't know if there's a next slide, but let's check it out. Yeah, so um, just a little bit more detail on the managing your health. We kind of talked about anything to do with appointments is getting involved. Um, speaking up for yourself because no one knows you better than yourself, right? So, and how you're feeling. So if someone's asking you a question, I know sometimes it might be tempting to look at a parent or a guardian or someone during an appointment, um, but just kind of taking that step to kind of speak for yourself, even if it's just one thing, right? Um, and it could be like, eventually you might not even want someone to be with you in those in those appointments, right? There could be some subjects that you don't want people to know about. Um, so kind of building up to that. Um, asking questions. Melissa and I talked a lot about how to prep for appointments. So creating maybe like a worksheet or having something where you can put jot down all your questions because sometimes you can get nervous and kind of blank um, and being able to kind of revert back to what you wrote down and what maybe you prepped with a parent or guardian. Um, and then you go in there and you're like, I got everything I need and I don't even have to think. Um, and then booking appointments, we kind of talked about, there's different ways now, right? A lot of people are texting a lot, like dentists now, some of them are using text message to, to let you know that you have an appointment coming or email, or maybe it's like voice activated. Um, so talking about all those different appointment booking styles. Um, and then of course, all the phone numbers, addresses, all of that, because that's kind of all, um, intertwined when it comes to transit, having to go to an appointment, knowing where to go, how long it'll take you, um, and all of that stuff. And Melissa, did I forget anything or? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. And then these are kind of just um, some of the things we chatted about. Next slide. And one of the things that um we were talking about too in the last session is finding apps that are, are helpful um, to help you schedule and, and reminders and um, hydrocephalus Canada and the association, the spina bifida and hydrocephalus Quebec. Um, we have an app it's available in French and English and it's called notes to self. Um, so you can check out, both of our websites for that as well. So one question was, how can I become more confident in understanding my medical care needs? 
I'm opening this up to anyone <laughs> that wants can, to answer. I can take the lead on that one if that's okay. Okay. Um, so being becoming more confident in your medical needs and taking care of your medical needs is a really big um, topic. But I feel like once you understand um, your needs and what helps you um, be the person you are and healthy and thriving, I feel like understanding what medical um, med medical things you need um, is easy once you kind of wrap your head around it a little bit. It took me a, a while to to get my routines down. Um, but I feel like um, writing notes uh, um, about your routines is really helpful. Um, always having your parents there for to ask questions. Um, when I started doing my medical care by myself, my my catheter routine and all that stuff, um, I had my mom around um, while I was doing it. She was just to watch and answer questions or help me when I needed it. Uh, so being able to know that you were there um, and learning all the steps in those routines is really uh, a big thing too. So uh, even if you just set up your supplies, that's a start. Even if you then after that, if you do set up your supplies and maybe um, do one of one part of your routine that's working on those skills and once you get a hang of those maybe those two skills you your confidence will, will grow and um i feel like that's how i got started i took baby steps and i perfected each part of my routine and that gave me the confidence to realize that that i could do it myself and that i was capable of doing it and having the support of your family um, there or your care workers there, if you need the support is really helpful as well because they, they're there to help you and to cheer you on in those instances and to be able to, to help you become more independent. Great, thank you for sharing, Melissa. So the next question I have is, so how do I become more independent from my parents? Um, I guess, is it like maybe a negotiation that I have to go through with them? And are there any tips? I'm sure Steph and Melissa have lots of great answers for this one, but um, I'll just chime in to say that uh, we use a lot of solution-focused coaching at Holland for you. And not everybody has to be an expert in that, but the the one like main thing that I always think of about it is that you sort of have to, to think big picture what you really want and why it matters to you. And sometimes if you sit down to have that conversation with a parent, you might find that you actually both have similar things in mind long term of what maybe adulthood is going to look like for you. Um, and so maybe then having that common goal and maybe them understanding where you're coming from um, and, and why being more independent is important to you. Um, can be like the first steps of a really good conversation. And maybe you don't agree 100% on that, where that starts, but at least, um, you know, it, it can start with sort of smaller things. Like you said, Sean, a negotiation that maybe independent start with some smaller steps of things that you'd like to do on your own or take on on your own with maybe just a little bit of background support from mom and dad. Um, and then sort of, you know, again, once you have that bigger picture in mind of what independence looks like, like for you in adulthood, then it's um, a little bit easier to start putting those little milestones and stepping stones along the way. Um, and maybe you won't get 100% of what you're hoping for right away, but at least you start moving in the right direction. Uh, but I will also see if uh, Melissa and Steph have some good insights on that one. Um, that was great. And I think, you know, learning how to negotiate with your parents will help you to learn how to negotiate things with you know, teachers and friends and in the end, you know, for a job as well. Um, so great, all great information. Um, this leads me into a next question about um, graduating from high school and really having no clear picture or clear career path um, 
are there suggestions that you can think of to help someone like would it be maybe a co-op program or a vacation vocational assessment program that they should look into to kind of give them a jump start into um, trying to figure out which way they want to go with their career in the future yeah um there's there's a few things you can do i think volunteering at different places and kind of getting a taste of what is out there is also a good option um any kind of career fair uh i know when i was in high school i went i remember in toronto they had a massive one where you could talk to a bunch of professionals about different um avenues you can go from um I remember talking to um, w whether it was like law enforcement or healthcare or education and just kind of getting a feel that way and knowing the different routes you can take, whether you want to do the college or university route, um, how many years you want to put into post-secondary, if that's what you're looking for, um, or any kind of program. Um, I think those would be like the main ones I'd say like get out there and volunteer and network and talk to people and then you could always just take like a general studies and kind of get a taste of everything and then you can kind of get an idea of what you enjoy or what you uh, find most exciting and then you can kind of um, choose a, a path that you that you think you might enjoy a little bit more and it kind of can open more doors. Okay, great. I think we lost Melissa, unfortunately. So um, this next question, I'm not sure if, if either of you can answer it, but we'll, we'll go ahead. Um, how do I prepare for my first visit with a new adult doctor? Yeah, um, so prepping is great. So any questions that you might have for your doctor or healthcare professional, writing them down, um, I think is a really good thing. So you can sit with a family member or a friend, whoever you're comfortable with, and write down what you want to share with the healthcare professional, maybe some questions you have, um, and get it all written down somewhere or recorded, whatever you want to do, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, just because I know when you get into an appointment, um, sometimes it can bring up some nerves. So having things written down so you don't forget. And also there's no harm in having someone accompany you in the appointment, right? Having that kind of support system, um, there's nothing wrong with that. And and making sure you set boundaries, maybe with the person you decide to bring to, to let them know that maybe they can be silent and only when you ask them for help, then they can kind of jump in. Um, but coming up with a game plan on, on what you're hoping to accomplish during the appointment. I was gonna suggest, uh, yes, bringing someone along with you. Um, I did that for my first adult appointment. And, and it was very helpful because I had specific things that I wanted to talk about and, and um, uh, questions that I had. And then the person that was with, with me was taking notes while, um, you know, we were discussing so that I didn't have to, you know, lose focus, um, trying to write down everything and, and remember as well. So I have just two more questions and then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, the one question was about uh, recreation and funding. Um, are there a lot of programs out there, like funding programs for different sports and, and recreation opportunities? Um, because, you know, sometimes if you only have, um, say the Ontario Disability Support Program, um, you might not have a lot of extra um, spending money at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a common question that we get. And um, fortunately, there are some, some options out there. Um, so it can be similar to sort of the breakdown when we're talking about how to access different um, adapted equipment. There's different sort of ways that you can go about it. So you could do it directly through the program itself sometimes. So um, some parks and recreation programs will offer subsidies and supports in that regard if, if um, finances is a barrier. So you can inquire with the program itself if that's, if say a reg registration fee is too costly, sometimes um, they have options. Even if they don't, it's for sure a question they've had before. So they've likely had to 
redirect and, and would have knowledge of what other families um, have been able to access that their program would be eligible through. So that's um, one thing you can do. Uh, another is then going through, um, there are some um, disability specific or um, organizations that um, will fund kind of broadly anything recreation as long as you meet their eligibility criteria of who they are um, supporting and funding. Um, there's really, um, there's also ones that are very general but specific to recreation. So anybody can apply um, if there's a barrier, um, something like a Jumpstart Canada uh, for specific recreation programs, camps, things like that. Um, equipment wise, uh, it can be a tricky one, but um, there are some options out there, uh, depending on um, whether or not they have, say, an income cutoff or um, uh, age requirements. So you always want to check the eligibility, but we have a lot of um, Holland Lorview clients access funds through um, foundations like Jennifer Ashley. Um, again, they have like a broad range of um, funding categories recreation being one of them. Um, so I'd say if you're looking to just start the process of seeing what those kind of bigger funding sources are going again through like I, one of the hubs. So Holland Borview, our family resource center lists a bunch of financial resources on our website, um, other organizations uh, that more broadly serve individuals with disabilities or children and youth with disabilities often will have that um, listed as well, or just give them a call. If you can't find the information, just give them a call. If they don't specifically have um, an answer for you there, they can probably redirect you. Perfect. And we have a list of financial resources as, as well. Um, last question. Um, and I think, you know, this is a general question for everyone that we, we all have um, anxiety and feel stressed every once in a while. Um, how do I sort out the sources of stress? And what are some good coping tips for dealing with stress? Can you chime in here, Steph, with anything or? Yeah, so that's a very loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say when trying to figure out what exactly is stressing you out or making you feel that way, um, write it down. So whether um, you have a calendar that kind of lets you see everything that you have to take care of, um, also using like a prioritizing sheet from high priority to maybe middle to low on your priority list and just kind of um, addressing the ones that might be high priority that you need to get done right away. Um, in terms of you were talking about some coping strategies. So think about things that bring you joy and try to do those things right to give your brain a break your body a break from those daily stressors of everyday life. So really reflecting on what brings you joy and what kind of helps you de-stress and making sure you're getting, you're making time within your week um, to do those things. Um, having a to-do list is also very helpful. So writing everything down, being able to check it off. Um, and also it doesn't have to be just work or school or any of that kind of related. It could, uh, on your to-do list can also be personal things, right? Making time, whether it's like, taking a bath or reading a book or doing an activity that you really enjoy or meeting up with friends if that's what brings you um which kind of that something that can ground you and make you feel better um or just listening to your favorite music exactly favorite, favorite album i'm going old school and i'm saying <laughs> album <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. what would it be now an, an app on spotify <laughs> maybe a podcast you find your, your fi find your favorite live stream i guess Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with this evening. I This is the end of our series, and I'd just like to take a moment to thank our speakers tonight, Shauna and Steph, Melissa and Kristen. And on behalf of Hydro Hydrocephalus Canada, I just want to say that we are so fortunate to have speakers with such a high degree of knowledge and skill. And you make the topic so welcoming and relatable and easy for people to listen to. And you, everything that you touch on is important to the community. So thank you so much. We'd like to thank our partners, the, your, your team, Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, as well as our partners in Quebec, the Association de Spina Bifida et d'Hydrocephalie du Québec, and the team 
uh, there who made it possible to bring this to you in French and English this evening. <laughs>